So one of the challenges of trying to treat people in the field is that one's very resource limited. There's, uh, you've got very little equipment with you and what you've got to do is make your best decisions taking into account the individual and what problems they've got, uh, what equipment you've got, what the logistics are about evacuating an individual and this is all quite challenging. In the hospital, I'm in a very different environment. Here, I'm usually presented with a patient who's fully worked up. Uh, they've had a whole series of tests done. Uh, I've got best available equipment and team of anaesthetists and uh, doctors with me that we can do all sorts of things. So it's, it's trying to adapt. And one of the challenges of wilderness medicine is trying to think outside the box and come up with the best possible solution. As a consequence, there's probably no, often no single solution that is the correct solution. Uh, it's what's, what you feel would offer the individual the optimal management. And different people will come up with different solutions. Different people have got different skill sets as well. So a surgeon would go down one route, a physician would go down another route. Probably the most useful people are anaesthetists. Um, uh, they, they get you out of a lot of trouble. In my experience, mental health problems are quite common. People either not decaring stuff or getting out of their comfort zone and suddenly realising they're struggling to cope. So having the skills to be able to deal with somebody uh, and to uh, help reassure them and get them through those difficult periods is, is very, very important. And then you've got all the other things like strains and sprains of limbs, ankles, um, and insect bites, mosquito bites, being able to deal with those. They're quite common certainly in the tropical areas. How has expedition medicine changed? Well, I think expedition medicine has changed as the world has changed around us. Um, I was down in the Antarctic at the right end, right at the end of what I call the classic phase of exploring. Um, the period up to about 1980 was a time when science ruled. Nowadays, we're much more talking about personal ambition in, in terms of why people go abroad or for reasons of social development or personal development. But throughout the most part of the 20th century, if you were going on an expedition, you had to justify it for scientific reasons. But it was also a time when communications were really quite difficult. Um, shortwave radio existed, and we could communicate certainly back to our base uh, supply station at Cambridge, um, or to other stations on the Antarctic continent. Um, but it was all by shortwave radio. And with shortwave radio, you could just about use Morse, and you, you could use Telex, which was a slow form of teleprinter, and you could talk. But if the aurora came out, you would often have a week where you couldn't communicate with the outside world. We're so used to picking up a cell phone these days and getting all our messages instantly that an awful lot of people these days would go into a decline if they couldn't get any communication at all with the world for seven, eight, ten days on end. So if I had a problem uh, down in Antarctica, I had to send a message to someone in the UK who could help me. Um, and that message would be transmitted from my base to Stanley in the Falkland Islands, it would then go to Portishead in Bristol, from Bristol it would go to uh, Cambridge and the Cambridge people then had to find somebody who could give the necessary advice to me and then the process had to be reversed. On in each occasion it was only done on pre-designated time schedules and it would take an age to get an answer. One of the things we've heard about today is how now you can now instantaneously transmit a photograph from one bit of the world to another via text or email, um, get an answer back from the expert and that expert can talk to you live virtually anywhere in the globe. And that's a huge difference. And it's a very important distant difference because it means that doctors no longer feel isolated. The other problem that we had down in the south was that if somebody was sick enough to be evacuated, they were probably too sick to be evacuated. There were a couple of evacuations from the base where I stayed at and it would take a week for them to be arranged and in order to get a person out from Halley Station, which is where I was based, you had to fly an aircraft from New Zealand to the South Pole and then from South Pole to 
our side of the Antarctic continent and then all the way back. It was like trying to get an ambulance coming from San Francisco to London and going all the way back again. It was hugely difficult and it was only done if it was absolutely necessary. So communications in all these forms have, have altered. And one of the things I've been talking about today is how with a cell phone in your pocket, not only do you know where you are virtually all the time, but you're able to link in to search and rescue services. They can identify where you are. And hopefully if you've got a serious problem, you can set, get a response very quickly.